Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> it's time for us to uh, start uh, this talk on the division of labor and social order. <clears throat> and let me start with just a uh, brief uh, remark on the latter part <clears throat> of the title, The Social Order. We heard uh, Tom Woods uh, last night wax eloquent about uh, the, the market economy and the social order produced by the market economy. And uh, I think uh, he expressed all of our uh, awe or at least appreciation for the uh, magnificent uh, accomplishments uh, of, of the market economy. <clears throat> uh, I, I just wanted to uh, add as we uh, go into this discussion about the division of labor that um, economics as a discipline was actually born <clears throat> uh, in the insight that society under certain configurations at least, that is the market, under that configuration, is a natural order. That it works, in other words, through uh, the natural uh, uh, inclination of <clears throat> humans to uh, strive by human action to attain their ends. <clears throat> and that this, uh, this was not uh, something like, a, the recognition of this was not something like a, an empirical, you know, a observation that the first economists made in the, uh, in the uh, 14th century, uh, but was a firmly held presupposition that the nature of the world was configured in such a way that uh, there were laws of human action and that these laws of human action that stem from human nature itself uh, implied certain uh, consequences. And one of these consequences was that uh, we can engage in uh, production in a division of labor. We can engage in social production <clears throat> without uh, central command, as, as uh, uh, Dr. Woods was uh, uh, explaining uh, last night. In fact, I, I dare say that uh, this insight is perhaps the central insight of being an economist. If you're an economist, you think that there is such a thing as a natural order in society. The society is a natural order, and it works uh, so to speak, by itself. That is to say, we, we make it work um, in our actions and interactions. And uh, of course, the, the, uh, the, uh, point of, uh, the big point of debate among all economists, if, if we define economists this way, <clears throat> is whether or not uh, the government is, or the state, the apparatus of compulsion and coercion, is uh, necessary for defending person and property or whether it's not necessary at all because we just get along without it, period. <clears throat> uh, by the way, I'll leave as an exercise for your, for your own uh, you know, application, uh, given my uh, claim about what constitutes being an economist, whether some uh, prominent modern uh, self-identified economists are really economists or not. You can, you can uh, do that as an exercise. <clears throat> All right, so we want to talk about the division of labor. And uh, we'll just start again with some definitions and some basic uh, principles. <clears throat> and then we'll uh, move on to some uh, illustrations. We'll go through the logistics of the theory of the division of labor. <clears throat> and when we talk about the division of labor, labor we're talking, uh, the idea of the division of labor is that we have uh, production by people not for their, solely for their own consumptive ends. So anytime people are engaged in production to satisfy the consumptive ends of other people, then we have a division of labor. So only in uh, self-sufficient production would we lack a, uh, a division of labor. Now we've already seen uh, uh, in this morning's lecture that all action is predicated upon the recognition by the person choosing to act of a difference in value between alternatives. So the person sees that as a means and he could apply it in different ways and one alternative has more valuable value to him and another alternative less. And he chooses the more alternative and sets aside the less alternative. And so 
to choose whether or not to be self-sufficient in production or to enter into a division of labor would be based upon the same uh, consideration. The person would just look at the two alternatives and say, there's a value difference between the two alternatives, so I choose one course or the other. So all uh, the, uh, the complete explanation of the division of labor is based simply upon existing differences in the alternatives. Now, we can identify these uh, differences, uh, again, with an illustration. So we'll use, uh, we'll use a Caruso and introduce Friday, and we'll just do this, again, a very basic way. But it should be pointed out that this could be extended, and I'll make comments uh, suggestive of this. This could be extended to all, uh, all the complexity of real social life as we experience it. So anyway, uh, just to reiterate from this morning, so we have Caruso's production with his labor. This is the marginal physical product of labor. In coconut gathering and berry picking, so these are the same numbers we had this morning. You can, you can apply one unit of labor and get six coconuts by climbing the short trees nearby. And then if he, once he's exhausted that, if he wants more, he has to apply another unit of labor. He can get uh, a smaller output and so on. He applies his first unit of labor to berry picking. He goes to the uh, most uh, robust uh, berry bushes nearby. Once he exhausts those, he applies another unit of labor. He goes to a less uh, productive uh, area of uh, berry uh, picking and so on. So it, so it all looks like this. Each entry then, uh, we're assuming in, in the chart, takes one unit of labor with the complementary factors of production. Now we introduce Friday. He has a marginal physical product of labor. The assumption that we need in order to see the, uh, what differences we're speaking about is we'll assume in the chart that each person, Caruso and Friday, has identical complementary factors of production. So the coconut tree configuration for Friday is the same as the coconut tree configuration for Caruso. The berry bush configuration for Friday is the same as the berry bush configuration for Caruso. That's so we have a pure comparison between the differences of their labor productivity. Right, so again, this is just an imaginary construct where we're, where we're trying to isolate these, these different causal factors involved in the differences between productivity and then what effects occur when people choose to take advantage of these differences. <clears throat> so we wouldn't want, for example, to do the comparison where Caruso had all the short uh, coconut trees with lots of coconuts in them, and Friday had all the tall coconut trees with not very many coconuts at the top. Right? We're, we're saying that their complementary factors of production are the same. So the differences we see are just based upon their labor. And we can see that we've uh, suggested here the most difficult case that we could imagine uh, analyzing. Well, actually, perhaps there are two cases of equal difficulty, but this seems to be a very difficult case of seeing exactly how Crusoe and Friday would configure a division of labor for their mutual benefit. Where are the value differences that, that make a, a, a mutually advantageous uh, division of labor possible in this case? So again, just to list out the possible uh, configurations we could have, we could have the easy case. The easy case would be one person is more uh, productive in the production of one of the goods with the complementary factors, and the other person is more productive in the uh, production of the other good with the same complementary factors. If our chart was that Caruso could produce a lot of coconuts and Friday could produce a lot of berries. But we didn't do that example, right? Because that example, that's just easy to see that they could uh, divide their labor by having each one produce what they're more proficient at and that their output would rise. Okay, so that, that's simple. Uh, we want to take this, this uh, more difficult case. Uh, this is the second possible case. This case is where, as you can see, Caruso is more proficient at producing both goods. He can produce as an absolute amount more of coconuts than Friday for each labor uh, unit allocated. And he, and he can produce more berries than uh, Friday for any given allocation of labor into uh, berry production. So that represents the more difficult case. Uh, again, uh, just to suggest how this would be applied to the, uh, to the world we live in, <clears throat> this would be a case where we had uh, like a very productive country like the United States trading with a much less productive country for whatever reason like, uh, oh, I don't know, let's say uh, Afghanistan. 
why would a very productive, you know, people who are very productive and could produce more of any, you know, everything than other people, why would they ever engage in a division of labor with these less productive persons, right? That, that's the difficult case. So, so that's the case we've taken. Now, there is a third case. A third case would be where the two uh, parties that were contrasting and comparing have exactly the same production schedules. So Caruso and Friday would just be clones of one another productively, but they have different preferences. And so they exploit, each one of them exploits their production down into the lower marginal physical product areas of their productive activity. Because, for example, let's say Caruso really likes coconuts, and so he devotes all his labor to coconut production. And Friday really likes berries, so he devotes all of his production to berry, uh, his uh, labor to berry production. If that's the case, differences would exist at the margin, and they could engage in beneficial trade. This, again, in the real world is how you explain trade between uh, people in different countries that are very similar. How is that possible? How do you explain trade between uh, people in the United States and people in Germany who have you know, similar productivity in different things? Well, it might be that their preferences are different, and so in the U.S. we exploit the production of something if we're in isolation to, to an extent that we've lowered the marginal physical product tremendously of of doing that, and the Germans have done this with another good that they think, like beer making, right? So they, they lower the production tremendously of that, and we, we uh, lower the production tremendously of automobiles or something. And then when we come in contact with each other and we think we can trade with each other, there are value differences to exploit, and we can, we can be made better off by uh, doing this sort of thing. So, <clears throat> so this, uh, we can cover all the difficult cases in the real world um, all we need, again, is the, is the basic assumption that there are differences in productivity, and in particular, excuse me, in particular, differences in efficiency. This is, the, this is a key, as we'll see in a minute. So I put these two words on the slide, right? Proficiency and efficiency. Proficiency is just the amount of the good that a person can produce with the complementary factors. So Caruso is proficient enough that he can produce six coconuts. So we say, uh, Caruso's more proficient than Friday in coconut gathering. He's also more proficient in berry picking. Efficiency has to do with cost. The efficient producer is the low cost producer. And cost, of course, in, in human action is opportunity cost. It's the value of the thing given up. And so I've made their costs different too, right? So for example, if uh, Caruso produces six coconuts with one unit of labor, a first unit of labor, he gives up two berries. So he's giving up three coconuts per unit of berries. If Friday produces, uh, he can produce five coconuts or half a, uh, a quart of berries. So if he uh, produces coconuts, he gives up half a quart of berries. That's 10 coconuts per quart of berry. So, uh, so we can see that Friday is a much, high, uh, much higher cost producer of berries uh, than Caruso. And we can take advantage of that difference, the difference in opportunity costs, uh, to the mutual advantage of the two parties. So any time there are differences in efficiencies, then it's possible to engage in a division of labor and uh, actually increase uh, physical productivity. OK, so this is the next step that we want to uh, see. <clears throat> now, in order to uh, uh, give the full example of this, we'll assume something about the demand for the products. Because the demand for the products, again, will dictate the extent to which production is moved down from the more efficient to the less efficient areas, and hence the efficiency differences. So let's pre presume, just for the start of this, that uh, Caruso and Friday have the same basic uh, preferences, but they have these different production schedules. And they allocate labor, one unit to coconut uh, gathering, and two units to berry picking. So if Caruso does this in isolation, he'll get six coconuts and three and a half uh, quarts of berries. If Friday does the same thing, he'll get five coconuts and one quart of berries. So that's how we're going to start in self-sufficiency. Okay, so it looks like this. Caruso allocates his three units of labor. He gets six coconuts, three and a half berries, three and a half quarts of berries. Friday does the same pattern of allocation. He gets five coconuts, one uh, quart of berries. So their total production is 11 coconuts, 6 plus 5, and 4 and a half quarts of berries, 3 and a half plus 1. 
But you notice that their costs are quite different. Their opportunity cost for producing berries is radically different. So again, if we go back to, the, to here, we see that if, if Caruso is producing at this point and this point, then this production of berries, I mean, uh, he's producing here. If he wants to extend berry production, he'll get one more quart of berries and he would give up six coconuts. So his cost for producing one more quart of berries is six coconuts per quart of berries. Friday's right here and right here. So if he produces more berries, he goes down to get one quarter of a quart of berries, but he gives up five coconuts. So that's a cost of 20 coconuts per uh, quart of berries, right? So they're radically different in costs. Caruso is a much lower uh, cost producer of berries than Friday. So obviously you have these cost differences, what should you do? What would be the economizing thing to do? It would be to allocate production to the low cost producer. That's what the division of labor does. That's how these two, uh, Caruso and Friday, would uh, uh, derive mutual benefit from their social interaction, from entering into a division of labor uh, with each other. Okay, so let's see what happens when they do that. <clears throat> let's say that uh, Caruso, let's say that both of them again just desire to allocate three units of labor to the production of coconut and berries. So Caruso, since he's a lower cost berry producer, he's going to give up producing six coconuts and produce one more quart of berries. So he's going to produce two, one and a half, one. That's how he's going to allocate his three hours, uh, three uh, units of labor. And so in total, he'll get, uh, he'll get four and a half uh, quarts of berries. And then Friday is going to give up berry production and he's going to move to coconut production. And so he gets five plus four plus three and he doesn't produce any berries at all. So he gets nine plus three, 12. So now let's summarize this. This is production in the division of labor. Caruso allocates his three units of labor. He doesn't produce any coconuts because he's specialized now in berry production because he's a low cost producer of berries. He gets four and a half quarts of berries. Friday goes the other way. Right? Because he's not efficient in berry production, he moves into coconut production, he gets 12 coconuts. And now the group gets 12 coconuts and four and a half quarts of berries. They, they increase their physical output in the division of labor. Because there are differences in the, in the physical efficiencies uh, of their conditions to begin with. So they're doing, they're doing exactly the same thing that everybody does in every action. They're seeing a value difference between two options, and they're moving away from the lower valued to the higher valued option. And by doing that, they gain. And here, the thing to notice, of course, is that here, they gain not only in uh, utility. In fact, we haven't even explained how they gain in utility yet. They gain in physical production. The, with the given inputs, they're actually producing more output now in the division of labor than they did in self-sufficiency when we add up all their output. So this is the key. Uh, this is the key insight. Now, the, the other question that we can address uh, right here with this example is, uh, how far should this specialization go? As we mentioned before, the more that Caruso specializes in uh, berry production, the lower his marginal physical product goes. And so he becomes less and less efficient at the margin when he extends his production. The same thing, again, happens in the real world. Uh, most of you know that uh, America, compared to the rest of the world, has uh, some uh, advantage, some efficiency advantage in the abstract in uh, agricultural production. So the question is, look, if, we, if, we, if the most efficient corn growing region in the whole world is eastern Nebraska, that's why they call them the corn huskers, right? then Exactly how far should this specialization go of American land in corn farming? Because corn can be grown in other areas that aren't as efficient, right? And the, and the answer is it depends on demand. It depends on world demand. So if world demand is great enough to outstrip the production of the uh, uh, eastern Nebraska corn farmers, then corn production would be extended to less physically productive areas. And that would still be the most efficient thing to do. Right? So it should be produced there and so on until the, the uh, efficiencies are at the margin roughly equated. So the corn could be produced, I don't know, in other places in the world as well that aren't quite as efficient. In other areas in the US that aren't quite as efficient uh, as eastern uh, Nebraska farmland. 
by the way, just as a, an aside on this, if you're wondering, well, what difference would this make? This, this is a point uh, that will be talked about in lectures uh, later in the week. If you're wondering what difference does this make in prices, uh, the answer is that it won't make any difference in the uh, rate of return, the interest return from investing in these different efficiency areas. But Nebraska farmland will command a higher price than farmland in uh, you know, uh, western uh, Iowa because it's more efficient. That's where the difference will manifest itself in the market. Uh, okay, so the answer is here again, I've done the calculation. The answer is they'll extend their uh, specialization until the efficiency is the same. So again, when Friday is producing uh, nothing but uh, coconuts, he's gone five, four, three. If he were to shift now out of coconuts and into berry production, he would lose three coconuts, he would gain half a quart of berries. That's a rate of six coconuts per berry production. That's the same rate at which Caruso is producing berries, the same efficiency rate at which Caruso is producing berries when he produces the last quart of berries. So at that point they will stop and they won't specialize further because specializing further would actually be detrimental to physical production. Um, <clears throat> by the way, it uh, follows from this that it isn't, uh, it isn't uh, fundamentally in specialization itself that generates the gain in productivity. The gain in productivity comes when people specialize according to the efficiency that exists in their different production processes. We would not increase overall uh, output if we had all of the oranges grown in Nebraska and all of the uh, corn grown in Florida. If specialization doesn't do us any good per se, at least not necessarily. It's that we have to identify the value uh, attached to these different uh, uh, alternatives. <clears throat> okay, so now let's go on to, uh, to the effects of the division of labor. <clears throat> and so this is the first effect we were just, we were just demonstrating, right? The we can now define the division of labor more exactly. The division of labor is not just when people uh, produce to satisfy the consumptive ends of other people. A division of labor is specialized production according to efficiency. It's when people recognize their efficient areas and move into those and, uh, and not just, again, producing for the consumptive uh, benefit of other people. <clears throat> and as we've seen, specialization uh, uh, in, in this sense uh, increases uh, productivity. But again, this is only because uh, there are efficiency differences that can be uh, taken advantage of. Now, the second, uh, the second line here uh, explains how the two parties uh, benefit from their specialized uh, endeavors. Um, because, remember, they don't wish to uh, consume what they're producing. They, 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 their desires, remember with Crusoe and Friday, their desires for consumption were they wanted a certain amount of coconuts and a certain amount of berries. They wanted to split, their demands were split between the two. But when they divide their labor and specialize, they're producing exclusively, in our example, one good or the other. Uh, uh, Cruz is producing only berries and Friday only coconuts. But they don't wish to consume this way, right? So if they're going to benefit from the division of labor, they have to be able to trade. And uh, one possible, uh, uh, of course, one, uh, given the fact that they've produced more output, it's always possible for them to, to trade and both be better off. It's just a question of what exchange rate they would trade at. So, so, so again, this is just uh, discovered on the part of people who wish to engage in the division of labor to get this greater productivity. They, they can figure out what the exchange rate is and then mutually agree to do it because both of them would be made better off. So for example, Caruso could trade one quart of berries for six and a half coconuts. And if he did this, he would wind up with six and a half coconuts and uh, three and a half berries. And Friday could trade six and a half coconuts for one quart of berries, and he would end up with five and a half coconuts and one quart of berries, which is, which is half a coconut better than they started out with for each of them. There could be other exchange ratios that would be mutually beneficial. So, Trade and the division of labor are linked to get, uh, together. We'll, we'll follow up on this point uh, in a minute. 
Now, the third point I have here says that specialization may augment or degrade efficiency. Once, once uh, people begin to specialize, then it may be that through processes, uh, let's say, of learning or uh, of practice or, uh, let's say, the uh, people who specialize their labor might, again, become more productive because they specialize as they learn how to do the activity better and so on. Or it may be that their land, they learn ways to cultivate it better to increase their productivity as they uh, advance uh, in, in uh, concentrating on just producing certain goods. So this is possible. It's certainly possible that specialization could in augment the efficiency differences and then lead to even more intense uh, exploitation of these uh, differences in efficiency. It's also possible, though, that specialization could degrade efficiency. This is just a, an open empirical question. So lefties like to point out that, uh, you know, our lefty friends, they, they like to point out that, uh, you know, uh, working on the assembly line all day and it's, it's boring and uh, people make mistakes and, you know, you get cars that are defective and, or you, you have all these farmers in Nebraska and all they do is produce corn so they wear the soil out and so on and so forth. But the point is, again, the, to treat human beings, as Tom Woods uh, said last night, as human beings. To treat human beings as real human beings who, who see these problems and uh, react to them, to solve them. So, so naturally, if you were an entrepreneur and you were running an auto factory and you saw that your workers be, were becoming bored and making mistakes, you, you would move them around, right? Or, or you would self-select the different workforce. Uh, I have a friend who uh, a few years ago retired from a job he had with, uh, with a gas company. And he moved to Arkansas and you know, wanted to get a part-time job. He got a part-time job on an assembly line where he just mindlessly you know, put widgets together or something. I don't even know what it was. He just you know, makes this connection and then the thing moves along and he does it again. And I asked him one day, I said, doesn't this drive you crazy? Aren't you just bored out of your mind? And he says, no. He says, no, I, just, I, I think of other things when I'm doing this. And uh, I can do that at the same time that I'm technically accurate. And, 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 and it's actually quite soothing and calming. There are people like this. And they'll, <laughs> yeah, and that we are different, right? And, and they'll select, they'll self-select into these jobs. That, that's what the division of labor, that's how they would solve this problem, or one of the ways in which this problem would be uh, addressed in the market. <clears throat> um, now we get to the principle of the law of association. Uh, the law of association <clears throat> is uh, taking this idea of the division of labor and, and uh, furthering it to, to a social theory, really, this theory of social order. <clears throat> and the first point to make, and again, we're just dealing with the technical aspects of this, but the first point to make is uh, the, one, the one I have written here is that each factor is efficient in some line of production. That while it's possible for Caruso to be more proficient than Friday in both lines of production, it's not possible for him to be more efficient in both lines of production. So as we saw before, the efficiency calculation for Caruso and Friday producing berries was that Caruso gave up six coconuts to produce a, another unit of berries, and Friday gave up 20 coconuts per unit of berries. That's what made Friday the high cost producer of berries. But if we were to calculate their costs of producing uh, coconuts, if we were to invert the calculation, then those ratios would simply invert, right? So if uh, Caruso trades six coconuts for one quart of berries, he trades one quart of berries for six coconuts. And if Friday trades uh, uh, 20 coconuts for one quart of berries, he trades one quart of berries for 20 coconuts, right? So this makes him a very low cost producer of coconuts. Because, why? Not because he can produce a lot of coconuts, but because he doesn't give up very much to produce coconuts. And so his opportunity cost is low. So one person cannot have efficiency advantages over another person in everything. This is just not possible. It's, uh, it's, it's a mathematical law of reciprocals. Right? If you have two ratios and they're, they're different and you take the reciprocal ratios, the inequality will reverse for all ratios, right? So, so if there are differences in efficiencies, one person more efficient than another in one thing, we calculate the other efficiency of the other good, the uh, efficient producer will be the other person, right? since the ratio will invert. <clears throat> now what this means, of course, is that um, 
it's always possible, no matter how slight the productivity of a person, for a person to enter into the division of labor, to outcompete everybody else because that person is the most efficient producer of something. So for example, uh, just another stylistic example, suppose we assume for the sake of my example that uh, Tim Cook is a great carpenter. He's a great handyman. And he can produce uh, you know, uh, uh, carpentry skilled uh, uh, works, cabinetry for kitchens and so on, so on and so forth, at, at say twice the productivity of the local, local uh, carpenter in Grove City, whose name is Frank uh, Weintraub. Would that mean that he would push Frank Weintraub out of a job? Would, it, would this leave no room for poor Frank? in the division of labor because Tim Cook is, is more productive than him, than him in, in all these different things that he could do? Well, no, because no local carpentry uh, company is going to hire Tim Cook to come and do carpentry work in Grove City. They would have to pay him you know, $500 million a, an hour or whatever he gets <laughs> for uh, running Apple. He's, he's a very high cost carpenter. And uh, Frank Weintraub doesn't lose sleep at night you know, worrying about Tim Cook come taking his job or, no, there's room for everyone in the division of labor. Uh, there, is, there is, by the way, a caveat to that, uh, to that principle. And the caveat is uh, that this principle is true as long as the human population is not large enough to fill all of the Earth's surface with productive activity. In other words, it, it, as the Earth is configured now, Human population uh, can all be employed, and we have sub-marginally productive land. We have huge tracts of land that are not used for anything. They're just idle. Well, we could put productive activity on this land, you know, in the Rocky Mountains or, um, you know, in, uh, I don't know, do they, what do they do in Canada so we could, you know, right? <laughs> make, make, we could put more productive stuff in northern Canada or, you know, Alaska or whatever. And, uh, you know, we're not doing that now. So w the human population hasn't grown to the point where it's necessary to take up every area, surface area of the planet in productive activity. If that were true, then, the then this principle of the law of associ association would not follow, right? Then if that were true, if the human population exceeded the, the actual surface area of produ productive activity on the surface of the Earth, then we would have sub-marginally productive labor. We'd have some people who could not find a place in the division of labor. And they would be permanently unemployed. Again, this is, this, some of our lefty friends think this way about, about the world, right? It's overpopulated and you have these masses of unemployable people and, and so on. But actually the world is not configured this way. Now, let me make one other uh, point about this with, again, I'm just uh, making these points as suggestive to, to use to sort of think about and um, muse over, as opposed to fully explaining, right? Uh, the other thing is that it depends whether or not every square inch of surface of the earth is taken up with productive activity depends upon the nature of our productive activity. <laughs> so for example, when we were, uh, you know, when the uh, normal production processes were primitive uh, hunting and gathering and agriculture and herdsman activity and so on, the, the, the possibility of the human population to cover the earth with productive activity was, was you know, fairly low, right? The human population that would have covered all of the earth with viable productive activity was fairly small. I, I don't know how reliable this figure is, but I've always heard that uh, when the uh, Europeans came and uh, uh, you know, discovered the, the New World, that the number of Indians living in what is now the United States was uh, you know, on the order of maybe two to 10 million, hunting and gathering and you know, primitive agriculture and, and so on. Well, 10 million people live in New York City, right? Because we have this extended capitalist production system. So, so, uh, so it depends, right? The law of association, in other words, will, it seems naturally, according to the progress of the market, would probably never be exceeded. That is, we'd never have this problem where the law of association was not true. The human population would never grow to the point where it exceeded the productive capacity of the, of the planet. 
Again, I just I, I throw that out just for your for your uh, consideration. Uh, let me make one last point about this. Um, it follows from this, if we're correct about this, it follows that there <clears throat> should not be uh, on on the market. There should not be something like uh, natural unemployment. Pe people could be willingly unemployed, right? You'd have people retire, or you know, you guys could uh, take take a year off of. Uh, uh, you know, after you graduate from college and tour in Europe or whatever. And, uh, but we wouldn't consider that problematic unemployment. There should be none of that. That should not be a natural condition of the market. If we, again, as economists, when we see uh, unemployment as a problem, we naturally point the finger, not at the market, but at something else. Why? Because the market is a natural order where people would naturally avoid this. There's no, there's no inherent reason for it, in our world, at least. Okay. <clears throat> so... Uh, uh, so uh, we know that employment can be indefinitely expanded as long as the market is working to accumulate capital and, and so on. That, this, that, that, that isn't uh, problematic. <clears throat> okay, now let's look at limits to uh, the division of labor. And one of these is the extent of the market. So this was the, one of the great insights of uh, Adam Smith, right? Uh, that, that the uh, ex division of labor can develop uh, only to the extent of the market. And we know again just from uh, economic theory, from just an investigation of uh, theoretical considerations in economics, <laughs> that if we were left to our own devices, uh, we, if we were given our full human dignity as human beings and not interfered with through coercive power, that there would be one world economy, that we would integrate all of our economic uh, activity into one gigantic division of labor that included everybody in the world. And all the possible value differences that existed then among people could be exploited. And we could be as efficient in, in production as, as humanly possible. This would be the natural uh, condition of, of the market economy. So, uh, so anything that interferes with this, this, this natural development of integrating the world economy into one trading, you know, gigantic trading relationship, one division of labor, would then uh, limit the extent of the division of labor. And obviously, government intervention is the, uh, is the uh, archetypical case of this. So the government uh, intervention in trade, if they prevent trade through coercive means, then they actually make us physically less productive. It isn't just that we don't get to buy those uh, great Japanese cars if they put a big you know, tariff on Japanese imports. It, it's that we be, the world becomes less physically productive. Our standards of living are actually suppressed by this. We don't lose just utility, but we lose the advantage of using our inputs in the most productive fashion. <clears throat> uh, and the other, uh, the other limitation that we want to mention, well, I've already alluded to this, right, is the uh, extent of saving and investing. Because it's through saving and investing that capital accumulates and we get more and more indirect production. So we move from direct production, this primitive Caruso kind of uh, hunting and gathering and you know, uh, primitive agriculture and so on. We move then to uh, uh, indirect production where we can engage in stages of production to produce capital and then longer and longer stages of production. Again, it, uh, since we are human beings, uh, we're creative and we have intellect and judgment and so on, uh, there doesn't seem to be naturally in the market any limitation to this. We don't, right? Once we have a market economy, then saving and investing can proceed ad infinitum as long as we're, as long as we're desirous of it uh, doing so. It seems to be, even though the government has heavily interfered with this process, that we've been doing pretty well anyway. Right? We become more and more productive. We accumulate capital in the world uh, year by year, and only government intervention uh, impedes this process. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about uh, overcoming the uh, limits to the division of labor. And we want to pay uh, some special attention to accumulating capital, since this is, uh, again, uh, 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 more on topic with respect to the development of the division of labor. But first, we can just uh, point out the uh, initial uh, idea from the last slide. 
that if we want to overcome the, division of, uh, the limitations of the division of labor, then we have to eliminate state intervention in trade. That would be the first step. Uh, because the government, uh, state intervention, can forcibly prevent people from trading. I already mentioned the case of uh, tariffs. So tariffs forcibly prevent us from trading, and that means that value differences still exist between the peoples who would have traded otherwise that could be exploited, right? We, we could buy all those great uh, Japanese cars, and we could reconfigure the division of labor to get greater productivity out of both the production processes in the U.S. and the production processes in Japan, or, or whatever it might be, you know, cell phones in Korea or whatever, right? So if they're tariffs or quotas or other kinds of uh, interferences, what the government does is create a permanent legal wedge, creating value differences that we can't exploit unless we're willing to break the law, yeah, in which case we would exploit them less efficiently uh, than if it were uh, permitted legally for us to do this. Uh, the government can also, through state intervention, can forcibly require us to trade. And that, too, would then diminish the division of labor. We could, we could be forced into trading uh, with other people for which there are no value differences. And we could be forced to trade anyway. Right? And what would happen if we do that is it would create, again, this artificial value difference. We would trade you know, more extensively than we choose to voluntarily. And we would push the efficiencies away from their uh, 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 greatest level. We would become less efficient. Uh, through this kind of thing. Uh, regulations do this, uh, or can do this. Uh, sometimes uh, production subsidies could do this. Right? So certain people are subsidized, and then they trade with other people uh, when they wouldn't have otherwise. And, and this distorts the, the efficient production patterns. Now, this leaves open the question, by the way, as to what, what would be the uh, process in the market of overcoming the limits of the uh, division of labor if they're naturally arising. We said again uh, that all, uh, in every action we're always going to aim to exploit a value difference. What if there are value differences that are naturally arising that people don't initially exploit? That, okay, sh should, should we have a, some kind of a policy to eliminate those? Uh, a classic example of this in the economics literature is, uh, is uh, transaction costs. You know, there are costs for making transactions, trading costs, right? Or there are transportation costs would be another example. And because of transportation costs or transaction costs, there can be residual value differences. So uh, down here uh, in the South, uh, and, and it may be for other reasons than this, but uh, I'll use this as an illustration. Down here in the south, I, I just noticed that uh, gasoline prices are quite a bit lower than they are back up in the northeast, uh, in Pennsylvania, where I'm from. So they're 30 cents, 40 cents a gallon lower here. Now, that's a significant value difference that might be exploited if we just had a market. It might, might be worth it for the sellers to shift supply, right, and to move it. Uh, it might be that transportation costs create some of this difference, though. And maybe even if we had a free market, there would still be a dime's difference worth of, you know, in, in gas prices in Pennsylvania versus Texas or something of the sort. So the question is, should we, should, should we strive somehow to eliminate that difference? Should we force uh, people to uh, eliminate the transaction costs? Should the government um, uh, eliminate transportation, absorb it socially, and, uh, and eliminate transportation costs among the private producers? Well, clearly, again, the answer is no to this. The answer is no. The, these value differences should remain until we figure out how to reduce transportation costs or transaction costs. Then they, then they would naturally be eliminated in the same process that all costs are reduced uh, over time. <clears throat> uh, these differences, uh, too, could be, um, could be based on subjective considerations. So the differences in, in valuations could exist uh, you know, uh, Mises and Rothbard like to use the example of uh, higher uh, rental prices in uh, New York City compared to the countryside. And there's value differences. So why aren't those completely exploited? Why, why don't the, you know, all the consumers, and, and again, there's government interference in increasing the supply of housing in, in the city and so on. But it might just be that subjectively people value things in such a way that we get these differences that are permanent. 
or at least not uh, easily dissolved. And if that's the case, well, we should just leave them alone, right? And let people uh, figure this out for themselves. You hear this kind of complaint again from our lefty uh, friends about uh, um, uh, economic imperialism of America. So, you know, we export our rock music, our, our rotten, uh, you know, culture to, uh, to innocent places in the world and corrupt them. You know, and, and well, we, you know, we, we shouldn't do this. Or, uh, yeah, but, but again, so economic theory would say, well, no, it just, it just depends on how people choose, right? It's true that if the government's subsidizing the rotten music, well, we should eliminate that. But, uh, you know, if it's coming about naturally, no, that, that's, that's fine. And if there are people who want to live in, a, in you know, without this, like, uh, again, in Pennsylvania, we have uh, big Amish communities. Well, they don't, they don't play rock music and you know, listen, <laughs> listen to their, you know, uh, big stereo systems or whatever. Uh, okay, that's fine, <laughs> right? So we, we wouldn't say, well, no, we have to eliminate the value difference inherent in that by forcing them to, to adopt our culture. <clears throat> so, so my point just being, again, I'm just trying to suggest lines of inquiry that, that this analysis of economics applies to. It seems like a kind of a narrow uh, argument that we make at first, but you can see that it, it uh, has more robust uh, results. <clears throat> uh, okay, so... Uh, then the second point, we want to eliminate economic decision-making by state officials, right? We want decision-making to be entrepreneurial because as we've talked about uh, uh, in the talk this morning and more uh, later in the week, entrepreneurs can appeal to economic calculation. So they can look in the market and see what uh, uh, consumers uh, value more highly relative to other things. They, they see the configuration of uh, prices of producer goods and they can make comparisons that are relevant to satisfying our preferences with respect to these value differences that emerge. Uh, uh, government officials, of course, do nothing of the sort. So they're just involved in uh, making decisions that, from the perspective of economizing, are completely arbitrary. Uh, again, just think of the difference between uh, Tim Cook and making decisions about iPads, and so he's produced the iPad Mini, and it's a wild success, and they're uh, satisfying our preferences and uh, rolling in, uh, in the dough and using these, you know, plowing these funds back into production of more things that we, we desire to have and so on, uh, versus something like uh, public education, where, yeah, lots of dough's being poured in, but preferences aren't being satisfied. Everybody's dissatisfied because government officials don't make uh, uh, decisions on the basis of our voluntary, on the satisfaction of our voluntarily chosen preferences. They can just coercively get the funds and then do what they want. So again, we want to move decision-making out of the hands of state officials back into the hands of entrepreneurs. This would certainly uh, overcome one of the limits of uh, the division of labor. Um, and in the division of labor uh, in the market, we have, uh, I gave an example of this before, we have the self-selection process in the market by monetary incentive. So we don't have to have government officials you know, choosing who's going to do what and assigning people to different uh, productive tasks we get this efficiency of self-selection. So if we had government officials uh, you know, uh, uh, involved in assigning tasks, they would assign tasks, I mean, if they wanted to do this in, a, in the most reasonable way, I suppose, they would do this according to uh, proficiency. They would see who the, who the most proficient uh, uh, assembly line worker was, and they put that person on the assembly line to put together the widgets. And, but they don't know what the opportunity cost is. They, they might, when Tim Cook was just a college uh, student, they might have you know, assigned him to be an accountant or to be a, to be a widget maker or something when he, he uh, turned out to be, a, well, I was going to say great entrepreneur, but that, the jury's still out, I guess, on whether he's great or not, but certainly a, a good entrepreneur. So we, without, without self-selecting in the market, we can't have any indication of what these opportunity costs are. And so the market provides for that full self-selection process. The entrepreneurs offering us positions, they're selecting us for different positions in the division of labor, and we select them as owners of the factors of production. We, we choose the job out of the array of things that were offered. And so we, uh, this, again, improves efficiency. We should have this sort of thing. <clears throat> and then finally, accumulating capital. This is the last thing we want to, uh, uh, to discuss. Now, when we talk about lengthening the capital structure, the process of lengthening the capital structure occurs in the following manner. Uh, people first 
reduce or lower the intensity of their time preferences. So all of us have a certain degree of preference for present satisfaction over future satisfaction, for having our satisfaction uh, satisfied sooner as opposed to later. If this preference is reduced in intensity, then we would be more willing to forego present consumption and save and invest. If we save and invest more, then we are devoting more resources to the building up of uh, capital capacity. And the additional capital capacity makes us more productive. So this, in a, in a nutshell, is the theory of economic growth, or theory of economic progress. Right? It depends upon the, the extent of our time preferences. <clears throat> so time preferences go down, we save and invest more, we devote more resources to producing the capital structure, the array of capital productive capacity. And th doing this makes us more physically productive, but doing it also lengthens out production processes in time. Because first we have to produce the capital capacity before we can produce the consumer goods, whereas before we were producing the consumer goods more directly. So this is the idea of lengthening out the capital structure. And then in the process of lengthening out the capital structure, we integrate new technology. And this too depends upon uh, the entrepreneur's determination of what is economizing. So technology is not like an independent force that some, somehow impresses itself upon human history. Uh, in the market, it's chosen. And the different lines of technological improvement are also invested in by the capitalists and the entrepreneurs, and then integrated into uh, production. So we get uh, uh, you know, all the various different kinds of uh, useful technology that is appropriate in, uh, uh, given the complementary factors of production that exist in our, in our capital structure. So it would be great to have those uh, beaming devices that they have on, on Star Trek, as we just beam ourselves all over the world and beam, we don't even have trucks hauling stuff around anymore, we just beam our cargo here and there. But we, we, and we may physically know how to do this, we may, there may be some sort of weird physics theory that allows for this, I don't know. Uh, but the problem is we don't have the capital capacity. We don't have the requisite complementary capital goods to produce this thing. And that's why we're not investing in it right now. <laughs> our our, our, our uh, investment in technology is better invested in technology that we can actually implement given our capital structure. So this is uh, what, where the improvement of technology comes from. All right, so let's take, uh, uh, we'll just use a, briefly an illustration of how Caruso does this. Again, this just gives us the basic uh, principles, and then you can uh, apply this to the more complicated cases of the real world. <clears throat> so let's say Caruso has this uh, new technology of uh, catching fish. <clears throat> and instead of using his bare hands, it's catching fish with a net. So he hits upon this idea, not a very advanced technology, but you know, still one that would improve his uh, productivity if he can em embody this in a capital structure. And so he searches around the island and he, and he finds that he can do this uh, and he get, engages in stages of production, a capital structure to produce this net that requires him to save and invest. So in the third stage, this we call the highest stage, he extracts the raw materials out of nature. He walks around and gathers vine and twine that's suitable for uh, you know, uh, constructing the net. And this, let's say this takes him seven units of labor, seven half hour units of labor. And then in the second stage, he goes back to his cave where he's living, and he, uh, he uh, uh, weaves together the net. He fashions the net. So that takes him five units of labor. And then once he has the net, he fishes with it. That's the consumer goods production stage, the first stage, or the lowest stage of this production structure. And then he would have a marginal physical product of his labor and fishing. And again, it would uh, exhibit diminishing returns because as an economizing person, if, if what's he's, you know, he could be a recreational fisher if he wanted and he wouldn't care how many fish he got, that would be one thing. But we're assuming he's interested in production. And so he's gonna go to the most productive uh, areas in the stream first. He's gonna, he's gonna scope that out and find out where the best fishing is or what time of day is the best and so on. He's gonna get the most fish. Then he exhausts that and he goes to a less productive area with his next unit of labor and so on and so forth. And so he, he exhibits this diminishing returns. And then the other question, the, the next step, of course, is how does he value these? He's going to allocate his labor 
into these different uh, activities, fishing with the net or gathering coconuts or uh, uh, picking berries, depending upon, as we said before, is marginal value product. So he, he, let's say he ranks things so that five fish is ranked above six coconuts is ranked above two quarts of berries. So each of, those, each of these he can produce with one unit of labor. But the other consideration we have to bring in, uh, into this uh, discussion now is time. Because the production of the fish takes an extended uh, amount of time for him to produce the requisite capital goods so that he can have the net and then produce the consumer goods. So he can't have five fish or six coconuts or two quarts of berries at the same moment of time in the future. In fact, what, and I'm just assuming that he would do it this way, what he chooses to do is invest over six days. Remember, it takes 12 units of his labor to produce the net. So he chooses to invest uh, two units of his labor each day over the next six days to get the net. And then on the sixth day, he catches five fish. And then he ranks that against, he could have five fish, in other words, in six days, or he could have six coconuts in a half hour today, or he could have two quarts of berries in a half hour. Now, where he ranks the fish, depending on the time, his uh, time preference, uh, depends upon his conditions. So before he engages in what we call uh, plane saving, saving consumer goods, so he has a stock of these consumer goods to allow him to save and invest, so he can shift his labor to producing the net while he's not producing coconuts and berries, so he doesn't have anything to, to eat or consume. He's going to save over a few days some of the coconuts and berries and then eat them while he's gathering the twine and so on. So once he engages in plain saving, then he would value the net and he would use it to, uh, he would produce it and, and catch the fish. So his uh, decision to construct the net, oh, and by the way, in the, in the complex social world, this is just capital investment, right? It's just, it's just a capitalist and an entrepreneur deciding what line to invest in. Where am I going to build up my capital capacity? What, what kind of factory will I build? Where would I put it? And so on. They do the same kind of consideration. They say, what are the sum of the values of the producer goods that are created by the net, discounted by my time preference? and compare the sum of those with the value of the things for gone. The asset value of the plant I, uh, facility from building it and the liabilities engaged. <clears throat> so let's say his preferences look like this. So he, uh, Caruso values five, uh, he's gonna get uh, five fish per week. That's how he's gonna use the net once he has it. And the net's gonna last 25 weeks. And he can start this production in six days. And after 25 uh, days of using the net, it disintegrates and isn't useful anymore. He values that more than uh, the goods he foregoes by constructing the net. And let's say, again, each day over the six days, he gets up an hour of sleeping and an hour of berry picking. And, and then he's going to have uh, maintenance costs, right, in parenthesis there. So that's how he decides. And maybe he decides again that, yes, it's worth it to me to invest in the, uh, in the uh, net, and maybe he decides it's not. That's, again, a matter of e economizing given his values. <clears throat> okay, so uh, just to summarize this, um, his capital accumulation, he first chooses the extent of his saving and investing, his time preference, as we say. And then he would invest in the different lines of capital goods that give the greatest difference between the value of what he obtains and the value of what he gives up. If the fish are very valuable to him and he doesn't give up very valuable uh, uh, alternatives, then he would invest in nets. Now, once he has one net, it's unlikely that he would immediately invest in a second net, right? Because the marginal value product of the second net would fall. What would he do with the second net until the first one wears out? It would just sit around. So he probably wouldn't do that. He would go to another line of investment and invest in a different capital good, just like we do in the real economy. We invest where the rates of return are higher, but more investing there dries them down until there's no, there's no value advantage in investing any further in uh, oil fracking or you know, whatever, whatever the new uh, activity might be. <clears throat> uh, okay, so... Uh, the, so, so he obtains the greatest value from this capital accumulation by investing in this, in this fashion, where the value differences are made the same 
at the margin in all things. And as we do this over time, then we become more physically productive, the human population can grow, and not only do we have more people, but each of us lives at a higher physical standard of living. All right, we've exhausted our time, so we'll quit there. Thank you. <laughs>